Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Jakari Jackson. It is August 3rd, 2016, and here's a look at our top stories. Tonight, it's Hillary's top 10, a growing list of accomplishments from her decades-long career in Whoa. public service. <laughs> Meanwhile, the Trump campaign responds to the wrath of Khan. Khan! Khan! Then, Democrat-controlled Chicago just had its deadliest July in 10 years. And how does Donald Trump really feel about Barack Obama? I think he's the worst president maybe in the history of our country. I think he's been a disaster. He's been weak. He's been ineffective. All that plus much more up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. I don't feel no ways tired. I come too far from where I started from. What do you consider an accomplishment? You know, it's the time for the Olympics, so a lot of people are talking about the accomplishment of sports. You think about a guy like Michael Phelps or Michael Jordan. I guess a good way to be an athlete is to be named Michael. And I think about the pictures of Jordan, you know, he has all, what, seven rings on one hand or Michael Phelps, all those pictures where he has more gold chains and Slick Rick and, uh, and Mr. T. Those are accomplishments to me. Or if you have a successful business, you started from nothing, you grew up in the backwoods of, let's say, Idaho, then you have some big Fortune 500 company. That's an accomplishment and many other things as well. But when you talk about the accomplishments of one Hillary Clinton, I'm always curious as to what people are referring to. <laughs> Because when I think about a person like Hillary Clinton, I think about the lies. I, I think about her stepping off uh, the jet and saying, oh, I was dodging all this sniper fire like I was Neo in, in the Matrix. And then Cheryl Atkinson, I believe it was Cheryl Atkinson, she comes out the CBS report. She's like, I was there and no snipers were fired. Maybe, you know, someplace on the other side of the country. Uh, but when we were walking off the jet, Mrs. Clinton stopped and took time to sign an autograph for a little girl. That There was no sniper fire that day. Or you think about Bill's bimbos, as uh, Mrs. Clinton has affectionately call these ladies, all these women who say that they had a relationship, whether willingly or unwillingly, with Slick Willie for the past several decades. And I'm not just talking about consensual um, shenanigans with people like Monica. I'm talking about women who say Bill Clinton is a sexual predator. And Mrs. Clinton has come out and demonized these women for doing sad things. And now we have this article here today, Hillary's top 10 accomplishments, because she's just, uh, I guess, the most qualified is what I keep hearing from uh, the people in the media. Now, I'm not going to go through the full list. There's 10 there, but there's three I'd like to hit pretty hard. We'll start with number three. This is not questioned by the mainstream media over her poor health and coughing fits. Now, if somebody else was in this position and they were continually coughing up a lung or if they were um, seemingly having a seizure, you guys saw that video last week where she was doing this kind of deal, like maybe a mild seizure, people would be all over that. And this is nothing new for this election cycle. I know you, there's been plenty videos, whether she was at some speaking engagement or at the I debates or whatever else, no where she just starts tired. coughing and she cannot seem to I stop for the life of her. Are. Even going back to the death of bin Laden or the story we were told about bin Laden's death. If you guys think about that Situation Room photo and everybody says, oh, Mrs. Clinton, she was so shocked. Because you see Obama, he's sitting here like this and all the generals. And Hillary, she's sitting here with her, her hand over her mouth. And people say, oh, she was so much in shock. By her own admission, she was not in shock because, uh, as we know from the CIA director at the time, he said they didn't even have a live feed of what was going on at the compound. Mrs. Clinton had her hand over her mouth because, by her own admission, she was coughing or sneezing in that picture. So she has a long history of health problems, but nobody seems to want to touch that. And we'll get to that here in just one second. Avoided being charged for her role in Benghazi, which directly led to the death of four Americans. Now. Mrs. Clinton has famously said, we came, we saw he died, referring to uh, Gaddafi. Now, if you can consider the death of Gaddafi an accomplishment, that was really the only accomplishment that came out of Libya. And by no means am I saying uh, Gaddafi is a good guy. He was trying to get his country on the gold standard back before his death. I, that's something notable. But by and large, there are many things I, I don't like about the guy. But after he died and you had all the terrorists come in and take over the country, the country is not better off. Not only are the people in Libya not any better off with Gaddafi dead, United States Americans here on the other side of the world, we're not better off. We're not safer with the Gaddafi dead because now you have all these terrorist organizations fighting over land, fighting for territory, basically going to terrorist college over there in Libya so they can come here and blow us up. And we're not any safer now that 
Gaddafi is dead. Of course, also to tack onto that, you talk about the situation in Libya, talk about the death of Ambassador Stevens and all the other guys who were killed in that compound because of the incompetence of an administration who on, on foreign soil with a United States ambassador com, uh, completely ignored his request for more backup, for more men. He said, I need more boots on the ground. It's getting pretty hot out here, not just for himself, but for the people who were there in the CIA compound. He was like, if something pops off out here, we're kind of out gunned here. We need some help. And what do they do? Even though he sent months and months of these requests of these cables to Mrs. Clinton and people like her, they did not give him more security. They actually took security away. But what difference at this point does it make? And also, uh, Mrs. Clinton has gone nearly a year without holding a press conference and answering questions from reporters. So this is one of the greatest sleight of hands that I've ever seen. Because anytime you see Mrs. Clinton, it's on some uh, fl friendly show like the Clinton News Network or uh, uh, Clinton Broadcasting Systems. And they write all these puff pieces about how she saved a cat from a tree or whatever else she did. Nobody actually gets to ask her a real hardball question. You know, we've seen the videos of her. She's walking past all the reporters. Reporters ask her questions, she completely ignores them. Or uh, the, the few times she does have some type of town hall meeting or, you know, she goes and speaks at a college, you know, she kind of laughs off all the hardball questions. So she really hasn't been under the gun, under the fire, has not had a chance to people have people really grill her about these subjects like they do somebody like Bernie Sanders or Trump or uh, I would even to extent assume Gary Johnson. She has completely avoided this. So in that, that is a very big accomplishment. But at the end of the day, I just do not know why people support this. Oh, let me take that back. I know why people support this woman, because we've gone out in the few Hillary supporters that we can find. They told us why they support this woman. They support her because she's a Democrat, because she's a, a, a woman, uh, because she has the legacy factor going with uh, Bill Clinton. Now, any of those things in and of themselves aren't bad. But when they're your prime reason, I'm going to vote for this woman because she's a woman. That's like me saying, I'm gonna vote for somebody because they're a man, that's completely ridiculous. I voted for Obama back in 2008. I didn't vote for him because he was black, I, because I was just raised a Democrat. That's what I was taught to do, you vote for the Democrats. And there are other reasons as well with that Democrat ideology that I had at the time. But uh, this is why people are gonna vote for this woman pretty much because they feel that it's their social justice warrior duty to do so. And one of these people who's going to vote for her is a GOP congressman, and he's supporting Hillary, and he also took thousands of dollars from Planned Parenthood. And this is a Republican New York representative, Richard Hanna. Planned Parenthood donated thousands of dollars to Hanna's campaigns in 2012, when he was one of three Republicans in Congress to accept money from the organization, and again in 2014, when he was the only Republican funded by Planned Parenthood. Now you think about an organization like Planned Parenthood, and there's a lot of racial division in this country right now. Like I mean, Trump's a racist, he's a Nazi, all this and that. But you look at an organization like Planned Parenthood that was funded by Margaret Sanger, who by her own admission, we got the photographic evidence, went to the Klan rallies, was speaking to the guys, there's those famous pictures, of the guys all saluting her. She got uh, essentially love letters from Adolf Hitler telling her how awesome she was. And now you have a group like uh, Planned Parenthood that's under investigation or previously was under investigation for selling baby parts. We've shown the videos here, you, you've probably seen them talking about, uh, I wanna use the proceeds from these dead babies and these dead baby parts to go buy Lamborghinis and saying all types of other horrendous statements. And the, and the kicker about this is, is they kind of like judo moved this whole thing to not go after Planned Parenthood, but go after the Center for Medical Progress who brought about these videos. And even though it, it, and it turns into this thing where it's kill the messenger. A similar thing with uh, Snowden and Assange and some of these other guys, and I know not everybody likes everything about these guys, but the point is they bring forth information about people who are doing way worse stuff than they do, and they're the ones that get in trouble. A similar thing with the Center for Medical Progress. They came out, they said, hey, we have these, th these people on tape saying these things, doing these things, and then they want to go out to the Center for Medical Progress. Luckily, that lawsuit or that case was dropped last week, and because they were going out to them not so much for the videos, but they said they use false identification, like they use fake IDs to get into. I'm like, even if they did, they're not the ones chopping up babies. But using a fake piece of plastic versus chopping up a baby just, I guess, doesn't compare in the medical or the American justice system. Let's talk about some other injustice or injustice. New documents reveal IRS headquarters in D.C. buried conservative groups' tax applications. And this is news coming out of Judicial Watch. The group released 105 pages of FBI documents 
which included interviews with Cincinnati IRS employees who disclosed that, that applications by Tea Party groups were automatically denied approval and assigned to a special group until they heard from the IRS headquarters in Washington, D.C. So just more proof of the shenanigans going on against conservatives. Uh, they, they want to keep tabs on you. And this is what I was talking about the other day. I did a report about this, talking about how the government will tell you one thing and then just blatantly lie about it. Like they never lied about if you like your plan, you can keep your plan. Or they didn't have sexual relations with that woman or any other number of lies we've got over the years. They say they don't do it, so they don't do it. Just like uh, I did the report the other day about the ATF. They're bound under law to destroy all information they have on the American gun owner. But what do they do? They keep the information on the American gun owner. And why the hell not? I mean, they're running guns to Mexico. I mean, keep, keeping a piece of paper on file isn't that big of a deal. But that's just how these guys roll. Now, as we're talking about this campaign, let's talk about Donald Trump. And everybody says Donald Trump's the crazy guy. He wants to lead us into World War III. Now, I do agree he's going to keep the military industrial complex well funded. I do agree with that. But I also believe Mrs. Clinton would do the same thing because Democrats will come out and support uh, war or these overseas conflicts, but they don't call them war. They call them kinetic actions, and that makes everything okay. We saw this in Libya. They're trying to do it in Syria, and on and on the story goes. But now they're saying Trump has his finger on the button, the nuclear button, as it is. And this is from a segment with MSNBC's Joe Scarborough. And he was talking to Michael Hayden, the former director of the CIA and uh, the NSA. And Scarborough asked what safeguards were currently in place to ensure that any president who may not be stable from launching a nuclear attack against another country. And Scarborough said he asked this because he was told from some anonymous source, anonymous source that Trump had asked multiple times about the nuclear button. Of course, the Trump campaign has come out and rejected this. Uh, their spokeswoman said there is no truth, that, no truth to this at all. And this is the thing with Donald Trump. You guys know I'm not a fan of the guy, but many of the reasons I find that people don't like him are just completely bogus, made up, sensational reasons. Like I go out to Atlanta and I'm uh, looking at this young man talking to this old, older gentleman. He's like, Donald Trump's grandpa was in the KKK, Google it. And the kid's like, you Google it. That's not true. You just made that up right here. And he's saying like, uh, his wife's here illegally. Like, no, she's not. You can legally immigrate from a country. But the key word is you legally immigrate <laughs> from the country. There's ways to do things legally. And it's these type of things that they keep hammering the guy on. They don't want to talk about eminent domain or uh, his views on domestic privacy or the wall or all these legitimate things that you could speak about the guy, you could debate him on, but they just want to make up stuff about him. And, and that's the thing I don't understand. For all the true things that are out there, they have to make up these things that quickly get blown up or they just blow something out of proportion. And then next week or next month, it's going to be uh, instead of this con deal, it's like, what can we do to take down Donald Trump this this month, because the Trump train doesn't so show any signs of stopping, but they will continue to throw things at them to see what will stick. Now, what about sticking with the job? The job market, we know that things are pretty tight all over. And now we see that the BBC is rejecting job applications from white people. And this is a job advertisement posted on July 29th, and it states in no uncertain terms that the creative access position is, quote, only open to UK nationals from a black Asian or non-white ethnic minority, end quote. Additionally, the website for Creative Access attempts to justify the racial discrimination by claiming that media cannot reflect society if it is not reflected in the media. Just imagine the backlash if a mainstream media company was discovered saying that we're only going to hire white people only. The outcome would be pretty, pretty bad. Now, a lot of people do this with a greater goal in mind, or at least I, I'd like to think that. Because, but if you think about something that's happened historically, like, for example, you take a historically black college. Many of those were founded at a time where there was segregation in the country, not this voluntary segregation that people do now. But it was literally black people do not get caught on this side of town after nine o'clock or whatever. So they had to build their colleges on the black side of town. And that's understandable. But now people continue to do these things and discriminate against other people for whatever reason. Now, personally, I don't watch a lot of BBC, maybe a lot of white people in there. I don't know. But just in general to deny somebody access to a job simply because the color of their skin is completely ridiculous in my personal opinion. We'll move on now to the city of Chicago. Every year, 4th of July weekend, we see the articles. Uh, you know, 20 people shot, 30 people shot, 40 people shot, whatever, in the city of Chicago over the course of one weekend. And why I think gun control is a part of this, it also goes back further than that 
when you talk about just the history of um, organized crime in the city in general. But before I get to that, let's go over the numbers. 65 people killed in Chicago in July, and that to puts the total number to 400 people killed this year. By comparison, last year, the total number of murders, uh, gun mur murders, was 490. And it's the deadliest year they've had pretty much in a decade. And when you consider this, as I was saying about the organized crime, these things have always happened largely because of the organized crime. If you go back in time and you look at something like the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, of course, that didn't happen in July. But that's a situation back in 1929 where seven people were murdered in a single day. And, you know, I think that combined with the gun control is a reason why they have such high crime in the city of Chicago and likely will for the foreseeable future because they just love them some gun control up there as well, as well as other things. Moving quickly now, we'll talk about psychiatrists drugging children for social justice. Basically, this is a great article from John Rappaport. I have to go through it pretty quick with the time I have left. But he's saying that uh, the rationale for drugging up these kids with ADHD uh, medicine is because they say it will help them long run in the schools. And one of the people who said this is a leading uh, expert. This is Dr. Michael Anderson. And he said basically his diagnosis of ADHD is made up an excuse to hand out the drugs. And you can read that great article from John Rappaport. It's on the site today. Now, before we go into our more special reports, uh, more special reports with Leanne McAdoo, John Bowne, and others, we're going to finish with this. We're going to talk about ISIS. D.C. Metro cop arrested for trying to help ISIS. And this is a transit officer. Uh, he had previously traveled to Libya in an attempt to help overthrow the Gaddafi government. If you want to overthrow Gaddafi, she just <laughs> teamed up with uh, Team Hillary. And we've seen other kids go over there, uh, high school kids trying to join ISIS. Then it doesn't work out too well for them. Why they do it, I don't understand. But you can understand this. You stay tuned after this break and you'll get more special reports right here on the InfoWars Nightly News. The Stone mainstream media wants your mind, your vote, and ultimately your rights. The political theater began with Donald Trump simply stating, First of all, it's rigged. And I'm afraid the election's going to be rigged, I have to be honest. Because I think my side was rigged. If I didn't win by massive landslides, I mean, think of what we won in New York and Indiana, California, 78%. That's with other people in the, in the race. Regardless of the fact that Hillary has so many skeletons in her closet, she has trouble closing the door. It's Donald Trump's character that is being ruthlessly attacked. I think the Republican nominee is unfit uh, to serve as president. Uh, I said so last week, and uh, he keeps on proving it. The notion that he would attack uh, a gold star family that had made such extraordinary sacrifices on behalf of our country. Kazir Khan was a plant and a media trap. Khan should be seen for what he truly is, a civilizational jihadist. It blows my mind even more than, say, this full court press with Khan, who got, what, 50 times more coverage than the, than the Benghazi families in three days than they got in year in, in since Benghazi. Yeah, they've been dehumanized. But the the WikiLeaks, which they turned into a, a uh, uh, Russia and Trump attack perfectly, the WikiLeaks shows that Politico, the Washington Post, um, you know, name brand big top big shots like Chuck Todd and Jake Tapper, they're taking their instructions from the DNC. In the 1980s, Khan wrote a paper expressing his admiration for Sharia law. And now, as Breitbart reports, Kazir Khan has deleted his law firm's website from the Internet. As a lawyer, he engages in procurement of EB-5 immigration visas and other related immigration services. The EB-5 program, which helps wealthy foreigners, usually from the Middle East, essentially buy their way into America, is fraught with corruption. U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee Chairman Senator Chuck Grassley has detailed such corruption over the past several months. This program has been plagued with fraud and abuse. But more importantly, it poses significant national security risk. Allegations suggesting the EB-5 program may be facilitating terrorist travel, economic espionage, money laundering and investment, fraud, are too serious of warnings against this bill to ignore 
yet they're being ignored. Khan is Muslim Brotherhood, as are staff within Obama's administration. Why President Barack is saying not hitting hard on the terrorists and on ISIS? And I know it sounds crazy, but bear with me. President Barack was born after his older brother Malik. The father, Mr. Hussein, named his son Malik, and that's one of God's names in Islam. The second son, he named him Barak. What does Barak mean? Barak is the right Prophet Muhammad, and we can see Mr. Malik sitting with Mr. Obama, visiting him in the White House. Mr. Malik is in charge of the Muslim Brotherhood in Africa. There's a lot of finances going on through Mr. Malik, and that explains that Mr. Barak is saying is not hitting hard on the Muslim Brotherhood. On the contrary, he took them off the terrorist list. For years and years, the Muslim Brotherhood is on the terrorist list around the world. In the Arab world, who knows them best? But Mr. Barack decided to take them off the terrorist list and start to be sponsoring them and put them in charge of Egypt. Caution. Hillary's camp will be setting more traps for Donald Trump as the race for the White House quickens. It is imperative that we see these quagmires for what they are. Donald Trump represents the average American fighting for the remaining cinders of the Constitution Obama and company have tossed onto the ash heap of history. Your vote and support for Trump is the only action that remains to pull our forefathers' genius from the fire. John Bound for Infowars.com. This is Ashley Beckford reporting for InfoWars.com. I'm here on the University of Texas campus to find out if people will even be voting in this year's upcoming presidential elections. We know there's a lot of hate out there for both candidates, both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. I want to find out if people think that Hillary actually stole the nomination from Bernie. I also want to know if they even believe in rigged elections at all. Do they think that Donald Trump will also lose the election based on Hillary's voter fraud? We know the Clintons have done a lot of crimes in the past, so let's find out what people think. You don't want to tell me if you're voting or not? I'm voting. Okay. He's voting for Trump. So what do you think about the, uh, the whole thing with uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz uh, stepping down uh, because of the WikiLeaks uh, hack that showed that they were trying to favor Hillary uh, to become the nominee instead of Bernie Sanders? I think it's... Uh... It's a problem. Well, I'm glad she stepped down, but I think it's also kind of weird that Hillary picked her up right after that, so I thought that was a little skeptical. But it just shows how the system's not as clean as we think it is. Do you believe that Hillary stole the nomination from Bernie Sanders? No, I do not. Do you think that Hillary kind of stole the nomination? Uh, did you hear about the WikiLeaks, uh, you know, leak of the DNC emails and how Debbie Wasserman Schultz had to step down? Yeah, I heard about some of that, and I definitely think there was some sort of corruption going on with the Democratic Party, but Hillary's definitely the better option for me personally, so I'm going to vote for her. And how does that make you feel about voter fraud in America, since you think that there's some corruption going on with the voting? Um, it's a little disappointing, but at this point, I mean, there's not really much we can do for this election. Being their bias toward Hillary Clinton from the DNC does not count stealing the election. That's just from the Democratic Democratic, basically, Congress. I always vote Democratic, so, I mean, unless there's a really, really good reason not to, I don't pay a lot of attention. I think the hacking of the people's uh, emails was quite an interesting thing, and the timing was very extraordinary. And the fact that they do seem to think that perhaps Russia has some part of it is, is quite, uh, quite possibly a, a situation, because uh, clearly Putin is a little bit scared of Hillary Clinton, whereas he thinks he can eat Trump for lunch. So, you know, there you go. I think there are ways people can manipulate elections. I think it's probably much more of a rare phenomenon, at least from a single-person voter point of view. I think that if there's any manipulation that's going on, it's from a systematic standpoint. Mm -hmm. Probably, uh, usually, in the way elections are organized or in such things as voter ID laws. 
and such things like that. What if they're a really bad person, like Hillary Clinton? Are you still going to vote for him? I, I wouldn't agree. She's a really bad person. <laughs> you got to see Hillary's America. <laughs> that movie by Dinesh D'Souza. Well, maybe I should watch Good that stuff. then. Yeah. I'll do that. <laughs> People don't steal the election. If anybody stole it, stole it, it was way back when George uh, W. got it. That was definitely something a little shady. Do you think that uh, Hillary could possibly steal the election from Donald Trump? No, I do not. You, do you believe in voter fraud at all? I do think it exists, but not to the scale that people want it to believe. You think people want to believe that there's voter fraud? At the end of the day, there's nothing we can do, and that's the problem. So I think we need to find ways that, you know, will actually allow the vote to matter. Because right now, it's more, ob more and more obvious that it really doesn't matter. Is that how you feel about the Gore-Bush election with the hanging chads and all that jazz? Well, I'm actually not voting because I don't have voting rights in this country. Uh, I'm a foreign student. Hillary has some uh, well-balanced opinion. I think Trump has some interesting opinion. Uh, but beyond that, it is not really my election to comment about. I talked to a lot of people out here on the UT campus, and what I found out is that people believe that there is voter fraud. They know that Hillary stole the election with the help of Debbie Wasserman Schultz. They know that Bernie only lost the nomination. Not because he didn't have enough voters or enough support, but because the Democratic Party is used to stealing things. She's been stealing uh, for a very, very long time. So to everyone who's actually going to vote for Hillary Clinton, I would say free your mind from mental slavery. You can get off the Democratic plantation. I'm Ashley Beckford reporting for Infowars.com. Well, if you are anything like me, you've been watching in absolute disgust as the mainstream media is doing nothing but attacking Donald Trump. And this, of course, is to, ver to divert attention away from Hillary Clinton's record, uh, of course, to not be able to dig into some of those scandals surrounding her and, of course, her proposed initiatives. Nobody's talking about the plan and what are you going to do? It's all about, oh, Donald Trump, you know, told a woman to <sighs> take her crying baby out of the auditorium. This, this is not what the American people need to be flooding our minds with right now. We need to know what are they going to do for our country. Mm -hmm. It's all about deflection for her at this point. And um, the, the, we do need to up, you know, bring up the level of political discourse. There's no question. But Hillary Clinton is doing a great job of deflecting her own record, her own policies. Uh, we're going to get into IS in a moment. Just that aspect alone of what this woman has done to Libya and Syria and arming our enemies and then demanding that they are allowed to enter the country, that's where he should be attacking her on, not this tit for tat right. stuff that we're seeing right now. Right, and of course, even President Obama, who is out making the rounds for Hillary Clinton, he's not even pushing out all of her success and, and accolades. He's actually doing the exact same thing, coming out attra attacking Donald Trump, saying he is unfit to be president. Of course, Trump responds, and he b blames uh, Obama and Hillary Clinton for single-handedly destabilizing the Middle East, mm -hmm. uh, handed Iraq, Libya, and Syria to ISIS, mm -hmm. and then they put Iran on the path to nuclear weapons, uh, of course, going on to criticize them, allowing dozens of veterans to die as they're out, you know, now parading these veterans' families. Right. But what have they actually done for veterans' families? If Mr. Khan's son hadn't died there on the battlefield, he, you know, would have had to been dealing with our VA system mm -hmm. here. Um, but Obama is actually speaking on what he knows, being unfit <laughs> to be the president. Because now, that you, now we're learning um, that this Iran deal and those Americans that were released, mm -hmm. uh, there was, the same day they were, they were release, there was a $400 million worth of cash sent unmarked <sighs> to Iran, uh, coincided with that January release of four Americans. And they were saying, you know, this was just their first installment payment. It's right. their money. It's their, you know, $1.7 billion from you know, the 70s or something that... Uh, I, <sighs> when I heard this this morning, I nearly jumped out of my skin. We don't negotiate with terrorists. I thought right. that was his policy. Do you remember the journalist in Syria last year that were beheaded in internationally because we, we refuse to pay a ransom, but we're paying right. it to Iran when they take to the streets and they yell death to America. That's who we give money to. Does it? Does this make right. any sense to well, you? They, were, we, they said that that was just their culture. Oh, They're right. joking when they say that they don't, they don't really mean that. They didn't actually mean that, although they, they take our 
our people hostage. They chant death to us, and uh, they're developing nuclear arms. But right. other than that, they're they're perfectly fine. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just amazing. Well, and it's also they're probably also joking when on their state-run media yeah. they're calling this a ransom payment, oh, saying okay. the Americans paid us ransom right. for their these hostages. It was illegal for him to do it. He had to do it in Swiss francs and euros because the legality issue. He couldn't even give them U.S. money. Uh, okay, if that's not, he might have a legal issue later down the road with that. Let's hope he does. Right, exactly. And so, of course, when this came out, Trump, of course, said that the Iran deal was so bad, it's suspicious. He said it's almost like there has to be something else going on. Mm -hmm. And, of course, you know, now these things are coming out. Well, the White House uh, has acknowledged that, indeed, Iran might use this $400 million payment to sponsor terrorism. Mm -hmm. Now, again, uh, this is the White House press secretary, Josh Earnest. He's saying, you know, that payment, it wasn't a ransom. It's just the first installment of the $1.7 billion <laughs> the U.S. sees in 79 after an arms deal with the Shah of Iran went bad. Uh, but he says, you know, the president was quite aware that they could use this uh, to support terrorism because they know that Iran supports terrorism. Uh, we know that they, Iran supports Hezbollah and the Assad regime. And it certainly is possible that some of that money is being used for those purposes. So that's precisely why they are deepening their engagement with their partners in the Middle East to counter those activities. So why was it so vital to make sure that we did this, even though so many people were like, why? This is dangerous. You're basically uh, clearing the way for them to get their hands on some nukes. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess Obama just wanted to have one more accomplishment under his belt. Right, because he's totally fit to be in office. You know, it's almost like the inmates are running the asylum here. You <laughs> listen to this, you're like, this couldn't possibly be accurate. Could this be real? Could this be really happening? We just gave Iran $400 million for hostages, but he failed to mention this. And, oh, he's lecturing Donald Trump at the same time that you're unfit to be president, although he just admitted that we basically gave money to sponsor terrorism. Right probably against us. Well, that's in addition to the weapons that we keep accidentally <laughs> dropping to them. And of course, those emails that are coming out showing that Hillary Clinton knew that we were arming um, the rebels who are also, of course, ISIS. I mean, the scandals run so deep. Mm -hmm. And talking about unfit to be president, that's exactly what Donald Trump came out and said. He said Hillary has no right to be anywhere near any government office. She's mm -hmm. unfit to serve anywhere near there. Talk mm -hmm. a little bit about what what she well, is <laughs> Hillary Clinton, as you know, she has a very aggressive uh, migrant foreign policy. She goes on places like Face the Nation and she says, look, we're facing the biggest refugee crisis since World War II. She lays out her argument. Basically, she's saying we, as you recall, we, we you know, had a situation and uh, appropriately so, we accepted people into the country that assim assimilated beautifully. She's trying to say that this is the same case. She's saying specifically of Syria, we need to take 65,000 more Syrians additionally every year. And uh, Pew Research said that if she's elected, we will actually have more migrants from North Africa and predominantly Muslim countries than Bahrain, Qatar, and Germany currently has. So if she has her way, we're going to have a, ma a continued mass population of unvetted migrants like Syria. And let's not forget, Hillary Clinton is directly responsible for arming ISIS. We understand that because of her emails that were leaked through WikiLeaks, Assange he pointed that out a few days ago. and. She knew what she was doing. She wanted to get arms in the hands of rebels that are now ISIS. I'm sorry, but that's how it works. And now she's saying we need to take refugees from an, a heavily ISIS-controlled population. Right. And just bring them in, non-vetted, and don't you dare question this. Or you're a racist, you're racist bigot. xenophobic bigot. And people are just lining up saying, when do we get our refugees? Bring mm -hmm. them in. We're so loving. We're so peaceful. Right. And there really does need to be some sort of a process. But there absolutely does. And ISIS has been in the news here so much lately. I know we're about to get into this cop from Washington, D.C. that was providing material support for ISIS. Something else that came up that surprised me in the Washington Times uh, last night, um, ISIS they have a hit list of targets, 700 U.S. soldiers. They're calling for people that are ISIS sympathizers already here in the United States or a part of the ISIS network themselves to target and kill U.S. soldiers specifically. Now, the bad part of this, it's on this encrypted site, Telegram. They have listed out these soldiers' names, their addresses, their private emails, their private phone numbers. And these soldiers live in places like Fort Riley, Fort Bragg, Fort Leavenworth, a places outside of Washington, D.C., and it has all of their information listed, they're on ISIS target kill list. Kill those dogs was the hashtag above this. Right. 
but we need to bring in more sympathizers, <laughs> more people that are going to be uh, in that same sort of thing mm -hmm. of we're now on the same turf as mm -hmm. the people who were attacking our homeland. I'm sure they harbor no ill will to the fact that their country has been destroyed by these policies pushed by the Obama administration and before that, of course. Right. So all of this is happening. ISIS, again, we talk about ISIS every single day, it feels like. And it, it seems like the narrative really isn't getting through. You know, I was watching uh, Jacques Hamill, his um, his funeral last night, Leanne. I was watching it at dinner. I was actually crying in my salad. I couldn't believe. Here we are looking at a case of a martyr directly at the hands of ISIS. We have a kill list in front of us. They're saying we're coming after you next, although we're not going to just be targeting your pastors. We're going to also be targeting your soldiers. And yet our leadership at the helm, we're giving money to people that hate us. We're demanding that they have rights and, you know, an unvetted process here. And uh, we, we're not allowed to even say a word about it. What do you think about the fact that they are so heavily gaslighting the population to where they all of this is, is unfolding around the world? And the leaders around the world are just telling their citizens everything's fine and this is the new normal and get used to it. Meanwhile, <laughs> they're really coming after Trump who says no. No, this is not the new normal. We're right. not bringing this to our country. Mm -hmm. We're going to build that wall. He's unfit, <laughs> Leanne. He is unfit to be how president dare of the he? How dare he, that xenophobe? That's the job of the U.S. president is to protect American citizens. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not to go around the world making bad trade deals so that your citizens don't have <laughs> any future and no right. forward trajectory. Giving their jobs to China in the TPP deal. We go on and on about the Obama legacy. <sighs> I don't know how much time we have to do that, but let me just tell <laughs> you, we, we need an hour at least to go on about his legacy and these and these ridiculous issues. And, and the fact is, we've got these sympathizers here already. I know Jakari Jackson earlier in the segment um, talked a little bit about this DC transit mm -hmm. officer who, you know, was caught. Oh my goodness! For years, he'd been under surveillance, and now, of course, he was assisting uh, ISIS, tried to send them some cards. So, I mean, we really do need to be careful. It really mm -hmm. is time, you know, it's to time. pay attention. It's time to pay attention. Thank you, Margaret. And welcome back. Our guest tonight is Steve Lane. He's running for District 14 of the Tennessee State Senate. Now, we've talked a lot about national elections, but it's also important for your local elections to get involved, whether that's your city council, your mayor, your sheriff. You want good guys in there, and I believe Steve Lane is one of those guys. And thank you for joining us today, Steve. Oh, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. All right, can you tell us about your platform? Well, uh, I'm actually running in a state race in Tennessee, state uh, state senate but uh, one of the important issues in our race that i think affects things nationally is uh, gas tax um, what's coming up in this uh, upcoming legislative session this uh, this coming january and february of 2017 uh, and into march and sometimes in april uh, gas tax is going to be high on the list uh, my opponent for example wants to raise the gas tax he's got a bunch of road construction lobbyists funding his campaign uh, so of course he wants to increase it I don't want it increased. And you may say, well, what, what does that have to do with the rest of the nation? Well, Tennessee has an overwhelmingly Republican legislature. We have super majorities in both houses. So if you're able to successfully pass a gas tax increase here, that's sort of gonna give the green light to states all across the country and possibly the federal government to go ahead and increase gas taxes. The idea being, well, if this overwhelmingly Republican legislature did it, then, then we can do it everywhere else. So th that's been sort of one of the hallmark uh, issues of our race. Absolutely. Uh, do you have any particular views on firearms? Oh, well, <laughs> I'm a very strong supporter of the Second Amendment. Uh, I, you know, I always tell folks, and I'm also a student of Revolutionary War history, that Second Amendment was actually originally the Seventh Amendment. It was just the Second ratified. Um, and I think it's important to understand what the Second Amendment is actually for. Um, if you go back and read, say, the Federalist Papers, uh, Alexander Hamilton, of all people, uh, he wrote, and I'm going to paraphrase here, but basically he wrote that uh, as long as uh, citizens could have firearms and if they were as well trained in their firearms as, say, the, the government was uh, in theirs, then uh, that would be the best possible protection against an, an over, uh, excuse me, an, a, a tyrannical government. And you have to understand the history there. What had happened was we had just come out of the Revolutionary War. So the birth of the Second Amendment was sort of a compromise between two parties at that time. One that said, hey, we should have a standing army if we're going to take our place sort of among the nations of the world. And this other camp that said, no, we should just have militia. We just came out from under the, the, the thumb of, of rulers who used the standing army to, to uh, hold the people down. 
And so the Second Amendment was a compromise in that we could still have a standing army, um, but to prevent that standing army from ever being used to oppress the people, you can guarantee the people's right to keep and bear arms, and that will give them that protection against a tyrannical government. Absolutely. Now, one of the things that's going on around the nation, you haven't had much of a problem in Tennessee that I'm aware of, but uh, a lot of conflict with police officers. Uh, we have uh, many uh, rallies and events that turn violent around the states. So I've been to many of them myself. Um, and with that, uh, many of the police officers are saying that they'd like to have things like heavy armor, uh, MRAPs, those type of things that we saw in Ferguson, Missouri. In the state of Tennessee, do you have any particular issue if police have uh, the heavy armor or the military vehicles? Oh, wow, do we? Uh, yeah. In fact, there's been legislation over the past couple of years uh, to be introduced to prevent uh, municipalities and county governments from uh, accepting those free federal government uh, handouts of heavy militarized equipment. Uh, I'm definitely opposed to the militarization of police. Uh, I think it's the wrong way to go. I will tell you this. We seem to be on this sort of merry-go-round uh, with interaction with law enforcement that greatly concerns me, especially as a parent and a grandparent. Um, you, you have this situation where police seem to be being trained to be fearful of every interaction uh, with citizens, and I, I, that's troubling. You know, I, I get it if you're in Detroit, I get it if you're in Los Angeles, but if you're in Murfreesboro, like where I live, uh, you just don't have those kind of uh, you know, armed confrontations possible uh, or likely, maybe I should say, uh, with citizens. So, uh, but what happens is so that that peace officer, he approaches that interaction uh, with that person sort of fearfully with their hackles up. And then uh, I think you as an individual, when you're approached by that uh, peace officer, you might be nervous because, you know, you're watching all these uh, videos of these interactions that have, that have ended very badly. And so you're nervous, and that sort of reinforces the fear that that I think is trained in to that uh, to that peace officer. And I don't know how we get off that merry-go-round. Uh, I I don't have the answers to that, but I do know this: uh, the answer is not more government power. The answer is not militarization of of peace officers. I could not agree with that more. Now I have to ask you about Trump. So we see Donald Trump, uh, there are people who are threatening to leave the Republican Party to go vote for Mrs. Clinton. Conversely, people are threatening to leave the Democrats to go vote for Trump. In your particular view, do you think Donald Trump is the man for the job? Well, I, th I think that remains to be seen. Obviously, you don't really know until you're tested by the job whether or not you're the man for the job. Uh, I was actually, I, I ran as a delegate for Rand Paul uh, during the presidential race. Once he dropped out, I became squarely in the never Hillary uh, camp. Um, at this point, I'm doing what I would do with any Republican nominee, and that is hold their feet to the fire, make sure they live up to their campaign promises. Because I do believe uh, any nominee, and Trump included, if as long as they live up to their campaign promises, obviously they'll be far better than Hillary. Our district that I'm running in overwhelmingly went for Trump. In fact, only one Tennessee county did not go for Trump. And even then, it just barely <laughs> didn't go for him. So uh, he, he did very well here, understandably so. And you see it even in our race, sort of the trickle down from that. There's just, just this anger amongst uh, folks, and they sort of have the attitude of, let's just burn this thing down, right, and just sort of start over. And you see it in our race. I'm running against a 12-year incumbent. Uh, this is the guy who, out of three terms, uh, he's used two of those terms to run for higher office. So I, you know, I tell folks all the time, he doesn't want to be your state senator. He just wants to use it as a stepping stone to higher office. And that's exactly the kind of stuff where people are angry about and sort of what produced uh, a nominee in Donald Trump. Absolutely. The site again is lanefortn.com, lanefortn.com. Now we have time for about one or two more questions. I want to talk to you about privacy because whether it's the NSA and their uh, bulk data collection or just recently we saw Groups like the ATF, it came out that outside of law, they're storing the information of the American gun owner. Do you have any particular views as to the storage of information or the gathering of information by the federal government? Yeah, the, the federal government should be collecting agency of any, or shouldn't be collecting information of this type of, of any kind. Um, you know, I'm sure you know this. I actually used to do an access television show with Alex back in the 90s, and we talked about this stuff way back then. So I'm really proud to see it become mainstream to have these sort of discussions because 
uh, when we were first doing it in the 90s, it, it was it was sort of, you know, you were you were painted as this extremist. And now we're having uh, very, uh, very honest and frank discussions about it amongst uh, the mainstream. So, yeah, I, I'm against any sort of bulk data collection by the federal government. We've even some some states and, and I would entertain it as a state senator where they've done things to to at the state level to, to prevent the NSA from doing bulk data collection, things like that. So. Uh, I would gladly participate in anything like that. It's it's real simple. The federal government is limited to a, just a handful of enumerated powers, and collecting data on on American citizens is not one of those enumerated powers. Absolutely. Now, Steve, we got about a minute left, so just take this time and tell us why you're the best candidate for District 14 in the Tennessee State Senate. Well, I'm not bought and paid for. Uh, I, I this is the first time I've never held elected office. I'm running against an incumbent who. 82% of his donations comes from PACs and corporations and special interest groups. I made a pledge early on not to accept any money whatsoever from PACs. In fact, right before this interview, I got a call from a PAC and they offered some money and I, I politely turned them down. I said, no, I'm honoring my pledge. So I would ask listeners, uh, viewers to navigate to our website, laneforTN.com, L-A-N-E-F-O-R-T-N.com. Consider chipping in a few dollars uh, because we're not accepting any money from from uh, PACs or special interest group, it's it's going to take average folks chipping in five bucks, ten bucks, twenty five bucks. That's what's going to fund this campaign and make it ultimately successful. Well, Steve Lane, best of luck to you, and thank you for joining us on our broadcast today. And that's it for our show tonight. We do encourage you to go to PrisonPlanet.tv and get yourself a free trial. You see the nightly news, the special reports, the rants, all right there at PrisonPlanet.tv. Well, I'm Jakari Jackson from the Infowars Command Center, and we'll see you again tomorrow night.